This is a sub $300 gaming PC, sort of. I'll explain more about that in a minute. It's based around the new AMD Athlon 3000G, which sports two Zen 1 cores and four total threads, along with integrated Vega graphics. Today, we're gonna take this ultra budget machine for a spin, and then with a couple quick turns of a screwdriver, turn this $280 machine into a $2,500 monster. This video came about because AMD sent me over their new 3000G processor to check out. It's the lowest end CPU that they currently offer and retails for only 50 bucks. It comes with integrated graphics and a Wraith cooler, although the one that I received, the CPU I received, was just the processor in a plastic clamshell. So I did have to strap on an older Wraith for this build. Seeing as I wasn't doing any overclocking, I don't think it made any real difference. $50 is a very tempting price point for a budget system build. And the fact that you didn't explicitly need a GPU in order to fire it up and get it running is definitely appealing. However, seeing as it is still a 14 nanometer Zen 1 processor with a meager two cores, it will have to provide some crazy value to be deemed worth it when Ryzen 5 1600s are still readily available on Amazon for just $35 more. Still, for people looking to go just as low as possible, it's good to see AMD offer something like the 3000G to consumers. And I think practically this is a decent product for those not really looking to put in heavy gaming sessions. However, that's not how we operate here on this channel, and I wanted to see how cheaply I could put together a build that we could still technically game on. So this right here is what I came up with. Now, what I said in the intro about this sort of being a sub $300 PC refers to two parts here that I use that you don't need to. As is, this box is actually about $380. However, a huge amount of that comes from the $90 Fractal Meshify C Mini, and the $109 Patriot 1TB SSD that I'm using for storage. I built with these simply because I had them readily available here. But if you are parting out a build like this, you can very, very easily chop both of those numbers in half. Pick up a case for 50 bucks and a 500 gig SSD for $50 instead. And with the rest of the parts exactly the same and performance unaffected, you've spent less than $300 and you have this build. The motherboard is the Gigabyte A320M S2H, which is currently shipping with Ryzen 3000 support right out of the box, and that makes it super convenient. Also in here, we have a two by four gigabyte kit of Patriot Signature DDR4-2400. The power supply is an EVGA BR450. I wanted to take a look at the performance of this system across a range of tests. Now, I wasn't gonna go too crazy, but I didn't just wanna run a few games and call it a day. I wanted to see how well it performs in things like Cinebench, Blender, Compression, and other CPU tasks as well. And in order to have something to compare it to, I decided to combo this video with another idea that's been brewing in the old hopper here. How does the cheapest AM4 motherboard on the market, this one, handle the most powerful mainstream desktop processor we've ever seen and is there any performance degradation versus a $300 plus motherboard with all the bells and whistles? So this right here is the Ryzen 9 3950X, all 16 cores of it, but it does have one deficiency, no onboard graphics. So when comparing the 3000G to the 3950X, one may have more cores, but the other can actually function all on its own without any help. So you tell me which one is better. In order to remedy this glaring omission by AMD, I've enlisted the help of a little GPU called the 2080 Ti. So our test configurations are gonna be the following. The first system will be this one right here, the 3000G with eight gigs of RAM and the A320 motherboard and no GPU. For system two, we'll swap in the 3950X, but leave the memory at eight gigabytes and also add the 2080 Ti as a display out. Even though, again, we're not overclocking, I did want to give the 3950X a fair chance at actually boosting correctly. So I'm gonna run it with the new Scythe Fuma 2, which in pre-testing proved to be quite capable with a dual tower, dual fan design. It was keeping the 3950X under 60C while running Cinebench, which is no small feat. 
System three will be exactly the same, except we're gonna up the memory to a two by eight gigabyte kit. So by swapping the CPU and the memory, which takes maybe a few minutes total, and by popping in this massive GPU, we've transformed our starter system here into the most beastly gaming PC possible. In order to see what kind of an impact the motherboard has on performance, we'll compare those numbers against two configurations using an X570 Aorus master motherboard. One with eight gigs of memory, like this configuration, and one with 16 gigs. The first test was Cinebench R20, and oh my God, the 3000G might be slightly overmatched here. What I find more interesting though is the clear performance deficit that the 3950X shows in the A320 motherboard. Keep in mind that these are the average of three runs, so this isn't just a one-time blip. There's a clear difference here in how the chip is operating and boosting. Next up was the Blender BMW scene, where again, we've demonstrated how the 3000G is not a workstation part. These are the hard hitting conclusions that you've come here for, I'm pretty sure. But look at the gap between A320 and X570. The X570 systems were almost 25% faster than the same hardware on a cheap motherboard. 7-Zip doesn't quite keep the same trend going as the average result for X570 were still higher, but not nearly by as much. Jumping up to 16 gigs of RAM on the highest end config did give us 2000 extra points. I guess compression isn't something that the 3000G should be doing either. The next test was Firestrike Physics, where we see the return of the significant platform gap and the continued flogging of the 3000G. I'm starting to think that comparing these two processors wasn't really all that fair. And to finish off our CPU tests, TimeSpy gives us similar scaling as Firestrike with the 3000G pulling up the rear. Now, of course, these tests are all in good fun and we can't take a $50 APU and actually run it against the $750 flagship. That's just silly. But like I said, I wanted to see both how this system performed and also take this opportunity to see if this motherboard could at all be a limiting factor. And the best way to do that is to remove the CPU as a bottleneck, which is what we've managed to do. So far, it looks like the A320 platform, while perfectly functional, will not really let the 3950X stretch its legs at all. But will the same hold true when it comes to gaming? I picked three games to test at 1080p using three different APIs, Ghost Recon Wildlands in DX11, Stranger Brigade in Vulcan, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider in DX12. Because I was running at 1080p, I didn't expect the Vega 3 graphics in the 3000G to be able to keep up. But the fact that it could run all the games at all, which definitely had VRAM requirements in excess of two gigabytes was impressive. I also ran some tests only on the 3000G at 720p low, which we can get to shortly. Shadow of the Tomb Raider exhibited no real disparity between either motherboard or memory configuration with these small frame rate differences chalked up to normal test variants. Wildlands was mostly the same story, although I'm not sure why the 16 gigabyte configuration on the X570 platform was such an outlier. I saw this and then I retested it to make sure it was accurate as it looked kind of strange, but these numbers were repeatable as I got 143.98 average on my second set of three runs, so we're just gonna go with it. Strange Brigade also tended to favor more system memory on the higher end platform, not by as high of a percentage, but at least by enough to be measurable. But after being the butt of the joke, for every slide that I've shown you so far, I did want to give the 3000G and our ultra budget system here an opportunity to show you what it can do in lower resolutions. So I adjusted our three gaming titles all the way down to 720p low, and I also ran CSGO as well. Counter-Strike here actually was a fine experience. Clearly 720p low isn't the best resolution for a game that requires quick and accurate headshots, but at least I could run around the map without any hitching or stuttering before getting immediately killed because I'm just terrible at this game. The rest of our titles saw marked improvements, but still weren't up to quote unquote playable levels. Going lower than 720p low isn't really a feasible option. So I think that while some light esports gaming might be okay, Anything even resembling a AAA title will be a little rough go for the 3000G. So what did we learn today? I think for starters, we can definitely say that building a functional sub $300 PC that you can use to play games like 
Minecraft, Rocket League, or even CSGO is doable and within the reach of most everybody. The 3000G enables you to do this and have a platform that is easily upgradable as well. You could start with this kind of system and slowly add on with a graphics card, then more memory, and eventually a better CPU. AMD's AM4 platform has certainly lived up to the hype and longevity that they touted when it first launched in 2017. However, as we can see by some of our results, if you want to get the most out of a 16 core CPU, A320 might not be the best way to go about it. It runs, and to be honest, it ran without any issues at all. Impressive in its own right for a $50 board. But you are operating at a significant disadvantage, which did show up during our CPU intensive tests. With that being said though, I am certainly glad that we put together this little box just to test out what the 3000G was actually capable of, and then try out a few different funky combinations as well with the 3950X and the 2080 Ti. It's always interesting to see what kind of results you're gonna get when you do something like that. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like down below. Consider getting subscribed to the channel if you enjoy this kind of content. Check out the merchandise store at bpscustoms.com for hoodies like this one. And as always, I'll see you next time.